Hello, my name is Rebecca Richardson, but most people call me Becky, and today we are going to be reviewing Ghosts of the Shadow Market by Cassandra Clare. So I've been really excited for this because Cassandra Clare is one of my favourite authors, and I've been waiting for this book for ages. It came out Tuesday, June 4th, but we didn't get it in Waterstones till the Wednesday, and so I had to go wait early <laughs> to make sure I got one of the five copies in stock. So, very big fan. I think I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the book and then talk about the individual stories within it because it's a collection of short stories and then kind of give my overall thoughts at the end. So I'm going to start by saying I'm a bit biased because all of these stories about Jem Carstairs, who is one of my favourite fictional characters and Cassandra Clare is one of my favourite authors. So if you're expecting an unbiased opinion of this, you're not going to find it. However, I will be giving pros and cons because even I can recognise flaws in a book. <laughs> this also will not be spoiler free, so if you haven't read this or the rest of the Shadowhunter Chronicles, because I will be referring to it within the context of the other books in the series, then maybe come back to this once you've read them. As I mentioned, Ghost of the Shadow Market is a series of short stories all following Jem Carstairs, who is a character we first see in the Infernal Devices and we follow him all the way through into the present series of The Dark Artificers. I was really glad that they did a series about Jem, not just because he's one of my favourite characters, but also because he's one of the characters who we see through all of the series, from the Infernal Devices all the way through to the Dark Artificers, and now the stories in this, which continue past the Queen of Air and Darkness storyline. And this is mainly because there's so much that happens in that like century and a bit that we don't hear about in the main stories. It's kind of referenced or sort of alluded to every now and then, but it was really nice to actually hear from him all of the things that go on during that time. I was really excited as well when it was announced because honestly I didn't think we'd ever get anything like this about Jem. Even though he was one of the main characters in the Infernal Devices, I always felt that he was kind of like, if a main character could be an underdog, Jem is that character. <laughs> you know, it, it felt like he was kind of overlooked a little bit. And so I thought if we were going to get a series of short stories based on an Infernal Devices character, it would either be Will or Tessa. So when there was rumours circulating that we were getting a Jem Carstairs short story series, I was like, I don't think so. It would be great, but I don't think so. And then it happened. So that, that was great. Thank you, Cassandra Clare. <laughs> so these short stories follow Jem from 1901 through to 2013 and all of the things he's got up to in between, I suppose. The first short story is Cast Long Shadows, set in 1901. And in this story, the perspective is split between Jem and also Matthew Fairchild. Matthew Fairchild I love already. We don't know much about him. He was mentioned in Tales from the Shadowhunter Academy and this, but I haven't read any of the Last Hours content that's currently being put out because I'd rather just wait for Chain of Gold to come out next year. But from what I know of Matthew, I really he's one of my favourites so far of what I know of the Last Hours characters. And so seeing him in this was really nice. So the story follows Matthew and some confusions in his life. Basically, he believes his dad, Henry Branwell, isn't actually his dad. There's all these rumours that his mum, Charlotte Fairchild, had an affair with Gideon Lightwood and he wants answers, basically. And the main plot of the story is him buying a... what... poison <laughs> from the shadow market that Jem also happens to be at, under the belief that it is a truth serum and he gives it to his mum and Charlotte loses the baby that she's pregnant with at the time. Honestly, I can't remember too much from the original short stories. I had to refresh my memory a bit before this because the first eight were released on ebook last year. So it's been a while since I've read them. And I can't particularly remember exactly why Jem was in the London Shadow Market at the same time as Matthew. I think it had something to do with the first air, probably, because that's kind of the main plot that follows all of them. But Jem's there and he sees Matthew by this truth serum and then he's also there later at the house when Matthew finds out that his mum was pregnant and that the baby's died because of the poison. A lot of these stories I don't actually have any cons, I'm kind of keeping the cons to the end and talking mainly about what I enjoyed about them and I think this was a really great one to start on. So I think my favourite parts of this one in particular were the characters from The Last Hours um, especially seeing more of Matthew and from his perspective, which I really liked, and also the others. And um, there was a lot of Lucy, James, and Christopher was in it as well. 
and probably the others, but they're kind of the ones I care about. <laughs> I also really liked the interactions between Matthew and Jem in the Shadow Market, especially the fact that all of the kids call him Uncle Jem, which I thought was really cute. I'm really glad that I didn't hear anything about the short stories before I went into them, because I do think there was an element of surprise, specifically in the first short story, that would have made it different if I'd known anything about them. So for the first half, we kind of see Matthew quite happy and you see him with his friends and that's kind of the main gist of the story. And then probably about like halfway through, he's like looking up at the tower and everything's great. And then there's just this one line that's like, Matthew would remember this as his last happy day. And I remember reading that and being like, what? <laughs> It, it happens quite suddenly and it's like the whole story just did a sudden 180 and I went from being like oh yay the last hour's children they're so good they're so happy to like what is about to happen <laughs> stress <laughs> so I was glad for that I thought that one line was different to what I've seen in Cassandra Clare's books before usually you don't get a very sudden omniscient statement like that usually it's all very within the characters and so suddenly having this godly voice speak through and be like he's not going to be like this in the future by the way was different but it added something to the story and it made me stress so much which was good because you want someone to feel emotions when they're reading i think that's really all the points i have to make about cast long shadows it was one of the first ones i read so i don't remember it very well at all but I would say from what I remember of it, it was one of my favourites, mainly because I just love Matthew's personality so much and all of his little scenes with Jem, but then the end was also so horrific and so depressing and I finished it feeling completely different to how I did when I started it and yeah, it was just, it was good from beginning to end. So next up is Cast Long Shadows, which is also set in 1901 London and this time we're following Anna Lightwood. Now before going into this, I knew absolutely nothing about Anna. I'd seen like some fan art of her, but there wasn't really much content on her the same way that there was Matthew and I was very surprised by how she came across but I was also very interested by it especially because usually when a book takes place pre like 2000s authors often use it as an excuse to write a less diverse books and so I was a bit concerned that throughout the last hours, a bit like in the Infernal Devices, there was going to be very little content outside of like straight white people, basically. I thought we were just going to have straight white people, but we didn't. And I thought seeing Anna very suddenly, bearing in mind I'd never heard anything about her, this character just suddenly appears on the page and she's a very large personality. And I was really surprised. And I'd say she's one of my favourites now out of the ones I've heard of. I really liked following a story. I thought it was done in a way that made her seem quite innocent, which I liked because at the end of the day, these characters are children still. And I think it's quite easy in YA to forget sometimes that it is children you're writing about. One of my favourite bits of this was actually her interactions with Cecily and Gabriel, her parents. The whole book, I was a bit concerned as to how they were going to react to finding out that Anna secretly kind of lives this second life because you could sort of tell reading it that they were going to find out and I was so happy with how it was dealt and the fact that they were like so accepting and they were talking about her clothes and picking out waistcoats and Gabriel had that line about how the waistcoat matched the colour of her eyes and I was like <laughs> it made me very happy to see that. The other main thing that sticks out to me about that story is Christopher Lightwood. I didn't know anything about Christopher Lightwood going into this. He's in Tales from the Shadow Hunter Academy briefly. He, he blows part of it up. <laughs> but you don't really see much of him. He's just kind of this slightly eccentric kid who's there in the background a bit. But I found as soon as I picked up every exquisite thing, is like as soon as I read his character, something just clicked and I was like, you're my new favourite. <laughs> you are going to be my new favourite. And I thought... Again, he was very much like Henry, which I thought was quite funny because he's not, not related to Henry. But I really loved how his character came across and his dynamic with the other characters, especially like when they were having dinner with Ariadne and he was just making all these really inappropriate comments and you kind of felt second-hand embarrassment for everybody else in the room, but it was done so well. And also the bit when Anna's crying and he tries to cheer her up and there's some throwaway line and I can't remember what it is now. 
I could perform a saving act of science. That's the line when he's just trying to cheer her up. And I was like, he's doing his best. He's trying so hard. And I'm really excited actually to see more of Christopher in the last hours and see where his character goes. On the topic of Christopher, there's been a lot of talk between fans about what his character means for the series. There's been a lot of discussion around him being artistically coded. And I don't think anybody's posed the question to Cassandra Clare yet on whether that's purposeful or not. He is a lot like Henry, like I mentioned, and nothing was ever said about Henry. But especially with the introduction of Ty Blackthorn in the last series, a few people have been wondering if we could be seeing another artistic character. And I am looking forward to seeing where those discussions go and seeing if they continue and seeing if anybody does eventually put it to Cassandra Clare. For once, I don't actually have any comments about Gem in that story. I think I was so focused on Anna and what she was getting up to that when I look back now, I'm like, what did Jem do? <laughs> in that story? I know he was there. I know he like fought a few times, but I thought her character was just done in a way that I was more focused on her than I was the others, which for a story about her was really good. So yeah, I don't actually have any Jem comments. I'm sure he was great. I'm sure he was an angel. I'm sure he was doing all the best things. Go Jem. The third story is Learn About Loss, which is set in 1936 in somewhere in America. Tennessee, I think. This story follows Jem, who's still a silent brother at the time, and sister Amelia as they investigate a festival. The general plot is that they believe there's a demon in the festival that's been granting people wishes and they've been taking up these deals with something negative and there's a bit about some guy poking his eyes out or something and they have to go investigate it. I'd say out of them all in this book, Learn About Loss is one of my least favourites, more because it wasn't at all what I expected it to be, but like, not in a good way, <laughs> kind of thing. For a start, I expected it to be about Katarina, which a lot of people did, since the title is Learn About Loss, and her name is Katarina Loss, and so everybody was like, oh, Katarina backstory, but that's not what it was <laughs> at all. I think there was mentions of her, I think she fit into it somehow, but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't about Katarina. I thought, I thought that's where we were going with it. My other issue with this one in particular is that I thought it ended a bit suddenly. So the story ends with Jem being given this illusion that Sister Amelia makes a deal with the demon for, where he gets to see Will one more time. And I thought we were going to like get a short bit of Jem and Will again. You know, I think they're in Shanghai, but we don't. It just ends. <laughs> and I wasn't expecting it to just end. I was just getting all excited for this like Jem and Will moment. And then it just ended. And I was like, oh, that's it. <laughs> okay. And I thought it just ended a bit suddenly. I do get that it was probably done so the reader can just sort of imagine what they got up to. But it just felt quite abrupt where it ended. This was also when a lot of the first air stuff started becoming relevant. And personally, I struggled a bit with that plot line because I thought it was very confusing. I sort of had to either reread bits and piece it all together in my mind or rely on people on Tumblr afterwards to explain it to me because I could pick up the odd bit here and there and be like, oh, so that kind of means this, but I couldn't get my head around the whole thing. So there were a few bits in this one that I was just a bit confused about what I was supposed to be taking in and what I wasn't supposed to be like contemplating. And then I had to go on Tumblr afterwards and was like, oh, I see. <laughs> Again, I don't have a lot to say about that one, probably because it was short and it wasn't one of my favourites. I did like Sister Amelia. I'm hoping that we see her again. I think I remember someone saying briefly that there'd been like rumours she was going to show up in another book or something, which I hope she does. Otherwise, it'd seem a bit pointless to bring it in. And she's the first like Iron Sister we've had a focus on. And so I do hope we see her again. But yeah, that's, that's learn about loss, I guess. <laughs> Next is A Deeper Love, set in 1940 in London. And this was one of my favourites. We've gone from one of my least favourites to one of my favourites. One of my favourite things about A Deeper Love was the representation of London and its people. So with it being set in 1940, that is during World War II and also during the Blitz, which if you don't know what the Blitz was, it was an attack on England, specifically London and some other cities by the Germans where they were just dropping bombs all day and night. And I was really interested to see how the people in the city were shown and it was done so well. It felt very realistic, which I liked. Obviously, I wasn't there. <laughs> I can't be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. But not like that. But in every way that you hear it described, that's how it felt. I sort of liked seeing the keep calm and carry on 
thing used within it. Not the actual quote, but the mindset was there. I loved all of the bits with like the ambulance trying to get through all of the bomb rummage and he's just like swearing and like, oh, like it's just a normal day and all of the people just carrying on with their life whilst there's bombs being dropped on them. And that's very much how you're told the Blitz happened and how the people of the city reacted to it and they were just expected to get on. And I was happy to see it shown like that because like I mentioned, that's what you hear, that's what you read about, but that's what you learn about, that's how the movies portray the Blitz. And... So it was good to see it shown like that within these books as well. And within all of that, you have Tessa Gray and Katerina Loss, who are working as doctors or nurses at a local centre, basically, where they're bringing in all of the injured from the bombings. During all of this, Jem is at the Shadow Market again, as he always is, hence the name Ghosts of the Shadow Market, and he's still looking for information on the first air. So while Tessa and Katerina are busy working, Jem's having a bit of a scuff with a fairy and that ends with the fairy stabbing him and the next you see of Jem, he's in the centre that Tessa and Katerina work at. Now this is also one of my favourites, not just for the representation but also the odd humour in it. There's quite a few scenes when Jem's like dying that he's oddly funny. <laughs> I think one of my favourite bits is when you know, they try to get him in the ambulance and the ambulance can't get through, so they have to take him out of the ambulance. And Tessa and Katerina are dragging Jem, who's like bleeding profusely, dying through the streets of London as there's bombs falling. And she's trying to small talk about the weather. <laughs> it was just such a little line, but I don't know, it just made me smile. I like little lines like that within it. It was also very stressful because as much as I knew Jem wasn't going to die, part of me was still like, oh my god, Jem's gonna die. And... I didn't like that at all, obviously. And it was very sad as well, the bit where they had him in the bathtub and he was like seeing things and crying out for different people. It was it was so sad. <laughs> and, like I knew he was gonna be bad. I knew he wasn't going to die, but it was still stressful. Also, was Tessa the first person to kiss a silent brother? Because I didn't see anybody talking about that. Like why is nobody discussing that? I didn't realise that was, like, a thing, especially with all the other things we know about Silent Brothers, and nobody was talking about it. And I was just sat there like, am I the only one wondering if Tessa just, like, made history? And if so, why doesn't she talk about that? Like, boast about it. <laughs> I'd say the only thing I didn't particularly enjoy about A Deeper Love was an odd inconsistency I found with the lack of mention of Lucy and James. So throughout it, we hear Will's name mentioned a lot, as we do throughout the whole book. And Tessa talks about how it's been three years, I believe, since Will died. And both her and Jem mention him. But we don't hear anything of Lucy and James, which I thought was a bit odd, bearing in mind they also live in London. And London is war-torn at the time. And I wasn't the only one who mentioned this, that it just felt a bit odd that, you know, we have Tessa's point of view, but at no point do we hear her address her worries about her children being in a war-torn city. You know, like, there's bombs, there's these bombings, and not once, like, I expected some sort of passing comment, like, oh, I hope Lucy and James are okay, or, oh, I have to go see Lucy and James. But we don't hear anything of them. Although I will say this isn't the first time this has shown up. There's been a few times when we've learned more about Tessa's plot line and everything kind of after the Last Hours era. That sat a bit odd with me. There's a few times where it almost seems like it's forgotten that she has children, when it's like, oh, Will died and then she disappeared. And I was like, but she has children. And so it's not the first time this has been something that's come up. And it's not the first time I've heard people kind of ask about it and wonder, like, what's going on there and why we don't hear about Lucy and James. And also the other, like, last hour kids, because they're close to them all. So that's, I think that's the only thing when I was reading it that I was like, hmm, <laughs> where did that go then? But other than that, I thoroughly enjoyed A Deeper Love and it was definitely one of my favourites. Next up is The Wicked Ones, which is set in Paris in 1989. And I have a few controversial opinions about this one that I haven't seen discussed too much. And that's mainly that I don't like Celine Montclair as a character. I saw so many people talking about how great she is and like, oh, we all need to protect Celine. But I didn't... I di I... It didn't sit well with me that her entire plotline for that story is her taking Stephen Herondale off his wife. Like, that that's basically the plot. If you haven't read The Wicked Ones, basically Jem is in the Paris Shadow Market and he meets Celine Montclair, who we find out through her perspective has had an incredibly terrible childhood and is 
madly in love with Stephen Herondale. But, you know, she's younger and there's this whole, like, it's just her moping about him. She mopes about him a lot. And towards the end, she meets up with Valentine. And Valentine is doing some shady stuff, obviously. And he's like, hey, if you keep this secret, then I'll, like, make Stephen marry you. And she just goes along with that. <laughs> she's like, yeah, okay. And I think it's supposed to be passed off as, like, oh, you know, she had a horrible childhood, so she deserves it. But, like, I don't... That's not how that works. You know, like, I don't care how hard her childhood was. That doesn't justify her just deciding to use this power she's suddenly been given by Valentine in this one wish to have Stephen divorced from his wife so he'll marry her. And it's not even as if he's happy about it. Like, Stephen wasn't happy married to Celine. Everyone knows that. He never loved her. It's said that he kept in touch with Amethyst, who was his first wife. He always loved her. They kept in touch. And I just it just didn't sit well with me that Celine's whole plan was just to take Stephen off his wife because she was sad, basically. That, that was that storyline. Oh, I had a bad time when I was a kid, so I deserve to make this man and his wife's life miserable. And I didn't I didn't like that. <laughs> However, the bits I did like about that story was Jem's plot line throughout it. I liked seeing him meet Johnny Rook and Rosemary Herondale, which this was kind of the first time that we saw both of them. And it was it's a good origin story. It was probably the one bit of the first air storyline that I briefly understood. <laughs> I was like, oh that's that's Johnny Rook, we know him already. And I also liked Jem's adventures as usual in the Shadow Market. I quite enjoyed the bit when he met Celine there didn't know her and was like oh hey you like this necklace and she starts going off about how horrible her life is and like Jem's literally just like necklace yeah and she's like my life's horrible everybody hates me I wish I could die everybody else around me should die I just really want to marry this guy but he hates me and Jem just like looks her straight in the face and is like oh <laughs> that's like his only input just, oh <laughs> I was like yeah that." I think that's how everybody would react in that situation. It was just so uncalled for. And it's just like... <laughs> so yeah, as usual, Jem was definitely a strong point in that story. Again, I don't have too much to say about that. I will say that I enjoyed seeing Valentine as well. Uh, we don't see too much of the circle back then, I suppose. And every time we do, it reminds me just how messed up of a plot line it is. That all of these, you know, like teenagers i guess we're just like yeah we're gonna like take over the world we're gonna get rid of all these people we hate and valentine's just leading them and especially since a lot of them are parents of the characters in the model instruments it was you know a bit of a, a shock but it's always fun to read about son of the dawn is the next story and that is set in 2000 so we have quite a sudden jump in time and this one is all about little jace herondale so this was actually released first when the ebooks came out last year I can't remember the reason. There was a reason for it. So I don't remember this one very well at all. I had to like search the summary beforehand, but I do have some points that I remember because I thoroughly enjoyed them. All I particularly remember of this is less of the plot and more about the actual characters, but I do believe it was centered around some sort of yin fen issue that was taking place. There was something to do with werewolves, I believe. And Lily Chen was there, <laughs> always a highlight. But the main point was Jace arriving at the New York Institute. So a lot of it followed little Jace kind of meeting the Lightwoods. And I really liked seeing all of the, the little Lightwoods. So like Alec and Isabel, we had an Isabel perspective, which was very cute because she's so small in it. I think one of the highlights for me was Raphael showing up and Alec trying to introduce himself with the line, I'm basically 12. <laughs> That's like his whole thing. Raphael's like, I'm 15. And Alex's like, I'm basically 12. <laughs> that was, I love that. And then Isabel makes some comment from a distance about how he's not basically 12. He's actually 11 or something. And it was just really cute. And I love the way that they actually felt their age in it as well. It was quite clear that they were all children. The key plot point I enjoyed in Son of the Dawn was Jem reminiscing about Will. This com comes up a lot, obviously, throughout the story, but it seemed very prominent within this one what we see with Jem is he's still a silent brother he's still brother Zachariah and we see him sort of forgetting about who he once was there's times throughout the story where he refers to himself only as brother Zachariah because he can't remember his own name but then there's other times when he's thinking about Will where he can remember his name and we see Will and Tessa brought up throughout it 
and a lot comes out about Jem in this and his struggles with being a silent brother that maybe he's weren't shown before. I found it quite shocking, actually, what he talks about and hearing about it from his perspective. You know, there's times where he can't remember his name and he talks about wondering whether it was actually worth becoming a silent brother or whether he should have just died. He talks about how maybe back then he was young and he wasn't ready for death and how he kind of wishes he had been because now he's in this situation where maybe dying would have been the better option for him. And through all of this, he refers to himself as Brother Zachariah and he talks about how Zachariah means remember and how he chose that name because he has so much to remember. He has Tessa and he has Will and he has Charlotte and Henry and all of his family and his parents and how by giving himself that name, he will always be reminded to remember them. And I think bringing this up at such a point added so much depth to his character that we didn't necessarily see before. The more we get from Jem's perspective, the more we hear about his life. There's a lot of discourse, I suppose, surrounding Jem where people say that he's very, like, one-dimensional, there isn't really much to him, it, he's not really, like, got any issues going on that the other characters might have, and in comparison to Will, maybe there's, you know, he's not the best I personally think that's entirely wrong. There's a lot that Jim went through, but we just don't see him dealing with it much, other than the Infern, which of course is like a huge plot in the Infernal Devices. But even then, we don't particularly hear much from his perspective about it. We don't hear about his struggle, how it affects him as much as I would have liked to. And I think throughout Ghosts of the Shadow Market, we've heard more about his issues and the sort of things he's been dealing with. I think the main thing in the Infernal Devices was that Will, even though he's not supposed to talk about the curse and he doesn't, he's still quite dramatic in true Herondale fashion, I suppose. We hear a lot about his issues all the time and we hear a lot about Tessa's issues because it's from her perspective, most of it. Whereas Jem kind of keeps himself to himself. It's mentioned at some point in one of the books that even when he's not feeling too well, he'd try and hide it because he didn't want the others to know that he wasn't feeling well. And so we kind of find out that he's very good at keeping his issues to himself so it doesn't have to have an effect on the others but finally hearing it from his viewpoint and hearing him talk about all of these internal struggles he's had for literally over a century I think it was a really brilliant time to bring it out especially at a point in his life where he can't even remember his own name and just wishes he could die I think it was a very sudden turn in his character but also one that I was glad we got to see and also proved that he's not just a basic, kind, nice character, whatever you want to call him, and that there is a lot going on, which I think is also another reason why choosing to write these stories about him worked so well, because you do see all of these other things happening that only he really got to witness as the silent brother present, and also hear about his struggles and see things from his perspective in a way that we might not have before. But on a lighter note, next is The Land I Lost in 2012, which follows Alec as he travels to Buenos Aires to try and deal with some werewolf conundrum that's happening. I really enjoyed this one because I'm a massive Malik stan. <laughs> I love Alec is my all-time favourite character. He always has been since I read The Mortal Instruments. And I loved getting to see an insight into his life now he has children. The beginning bit with him and Magnus and Max in the house I thought was just so cute with the demon there. What's it called? Like Elias, Elias, something like that. Him present for whatever reason and Max babbling away and talking about demons or demons. <laughs> All the demons. And something about Magnus having a sailor suit of shame for him, which was just so Magnus. I'm fairly certain I've seen a joke somewhere about people being like, oh, I bet Magnus is going to buy him really bad fashion and like make him wear it as a punishment. And then here we have the sailor suit of shame. It actually exists. <laughs> and just that little insight into their home life at the beginning was so cute. But I also really enjoyed the actual plot of this story as well. So most of the story took place in Buenos Aires with Alec investigating some issues going on in the shadow market there with werewolf women going missing. With him we see Lily Chen again, who I love, and Gem and Tessa also come along too. In short, they find out that these werewolf women are being captured and taken to a house nearby where they're being used to try and breed werewolf warlocks of some sort and they have to break into the house and save them. But of course along the way we meet little Raphael now known as Raphael Lightwood Bane, who is so adorable. And I think one of the best bits of this story for me was seeing Alec and Raphael interact because Raphael really didn't like him at first, which I thought was so hilarious. He was just insulting him and like, nah, mate. But 
I don't think anybody expected Alex to be as good with children as he is. <laughs> and by the end of it, they were just like so much closer. And there's something great about Alec just looking at a child and being like, that's mine now, I've adopted that one. It was just, I really love that. It's twice now that he's just saw a child and being like, that's mine. <laughs> I want that one. And we all love him for it. Another brilliant bit, of course, was Lily's nicknames for Jem. You know, they just never get old. It's always funny. I still see people talking about them. And they're like, there's some great puns in there. And that was like one of the best bits of the whole book, really, in general, was just seeing Lily's recurring theme of bad nicknames for Jem that everybody enjoyed. Every time Lily shows up, I'm like, nickname time. I loved it and I hope we kind of see that continue a bit throughout the actual books because it was just like really funny. I also like the setting of this one. We haven't seen the Buenos Aires Institute before so that was interesting and some of the characters in it were really nice as well. Most of them weren't but there was one guy. There was, <laughs> there was one nice guy and so it was nice to see someone new and also see where Raphael like was born. I thought that was really great. And the bit at the end when Alec took him home, the entire story just felt so wholesome and I was really glad for that. Three stories left to go through and the eighth is Through Blood, Through Fire, which mainly focuses around Gem and Tessa and Rosemary Herondale's storyline. So I have mentioned before that the whole first air plotline kind of confused me a bit, but I did enjoy kind of hearing about Rosemary's background and when Kit was born and all of the stuff even before that with Johnny. And I thought it was done really well, sort of through Tessa's thoughts, but when Tessa's thoughts were Rosemary's thoughts, there was a lot of it. I would say that's my only issue with it, is I did get a bit bored eventually. I was like, okay, we get it, she's dead, let's move on. But overall, I did enjoy hearing about her and hearing about where Kit came from, and it did make a lot of the first air stuff kind of make a bit more sense in an odd way, because you could kind of see more of Rosemary's personality. And... It was also then nice to be able to apply that to Kit when Queen of Erin Darkness came out and look at her and be like, oh, we know more about what happened to you now. You know, for so long, the mystery was like, oh, who's Kit's mum? There was like theories about her being an angel and stuff. But actually having a name for her and knowing where she came from and what happened and how Kit ended up with a, a pretty crap father was, it, it was a good read. It was an interesting read, but did go on for a while. Of course, however, the main thing that I remember from Through Blood Through Fire is the announcement that Tessa is pregnant and baby Carstairs was all over my Tumblr dash for so long. Everybody was talking about baby Carstairs and this was like November or something and we had to wait so long to find out more about baby Carstairs that it feels odd knowing she has a name now that isn't just baby Carstairs. And that was like all I focused on in that story was just baby Carstairs. <laughs> And that's all I really have to say about that one, because baby casters. <laughs> the final two stories were only released in the physical copy of Ghost of the Shadow Market. So these two I actually read today. And the first of those is The Lost World. This is one of the shorter ones, and the main focus of the story is Livy and Ty Blackthorn. Personally, it was one of my least favourites, mainly because Jem wasn't in it. <laughs> like... The entire series is about Jem, and he cameoed in it. Jem cameoed in his own book. <laughs> like, how, how did that even happen? The whole thing was from Livy Blackthorn's perspective, which at first I enjoyed. I'm quite glad that we got to see her perspective as a ghost, because that was really interesting, and so, so sad as well. Like, she didn't deserve to die. And even she says that, even she's like, wow, I shouldn't be dead. And sort of seeing this kid who throughout the first two Dark Artifices books is quite bubbly and quite confident and she has friends and then seeing her as a ghost and just all of these incredibly dark emotions and all the time that she spent at that lake nearby which I can't remember the name of now just sinking into the darkness and it was just such a, a sudden change in character from how we saw her in Lady Midnight and Lord of Shadows that it was sad and it was a shock however I will say that I was like kind of ready to call an exorcist when she tried to like take over baby casters <laughs> i don't even know what that was about one minute she's fine and then suddenly we're in a conservatory and jem's playing the cello for whatever reason i've never seen jem play the cello before and she's considering kicking out the soul of baby casters mina now and i was like no <laughs> don't do that i went very quickly from oh you know olivia deserves better i feel really sorry for her to 
throw the whole ghost in the trash, please call an exorcist. She needs to go. <laughs> but, you know, it was explained that wasn't really her. She was too far away from Ty. There was all these reasons for it. Magnus was there about it. So, like, it, it did get explained, but there was a moment where suddenly I was like, wow, I, I suddenly aren't sorry for you. But I, it was explained and everything's good. And I am looking forward to seeing how the plotline with the ghost kind of goes. It's just there was a lot of talk throughout The Lost World where she was discussing about coming back and how everybody else seemed to get to return but her. And I don't know, maybe it was just me reading too much into it, but also knowing what Cassandra Clare's like, she doesn't... She kills characters, but she doesn't really kill main characters unless they, like, die of old age. And I know that she tends to often work towards happy things. There hasn't been many times in a Cassandra Clare book where I've been sad for a long time like there hasn't really been any major things that has then continued throughout the book and so I'm not expecting Livy to be dead the whole of the Wicked Powers I am expecting her to return otherwise she is an incredibly negative plot point I suppose she's a whole subplot that is very negative and very depressing that would continue throughout and where I would expect another author maybe to keep that in I'm not expecting Cassandra Clare to keep that in mainly because it's not the sort of thing we usually see. So I think either Livy's going to get some sort of peace and she's going to be, like, expelled to wherever ghosts go or something, or she is actually going to return. One bit I did enjoy about The Lost World was the scene with Tessa in labour. I would have liked to see it from another character's perspective, as I've mentioned, like, Jem literally cameoed in his own book. <laughs> but I did enjoy that. It was all very confusing and very stressful, I think the first thing I picked up on was the fact Jem was playing the cello and I was like, why is why is Jem playing the cello? We've never seen Jem play the cello before. Why is Jem playing the cello? Why is Magnus in his pyjamas? Why is Livy trying to kill a child? What's happening? It, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot in one go. and they, But it was quite funny as well, the way Tessa dealt with it. She was like so chill. You know, she's there like, this is my third kid. It's fine. I know what's up now. And when she was like groaning and then Jem was like, oh, I know my cello playing's a abhorrent or something. And I'm like, no, honey, I don't, I don't think that's why she's groaning. <laughs> I don't think that's a problem. It was quite a funny point to Jem's personality that he stress plays instruments. I don't think we've seen him play an instrument out of stress yet. We've seen him emotionally play instruments a lot of times. But just this idea that Tessa was like, I'm in labour. And he was like, better get my cello. <laughs> was it was a great moment also i do hope we see more of the cello because this is just something come out of nowhere that he's learning to play the cello and as i just i want to know how that's going i want like monthly updates on gem's cello practice <laughs> the last story is forever fallen which follows gem and also thule jace who i'm only going to call thule jace because i refuse to call him janus which is the name he chose for himself and it sounds so stupid you know what it sounds like and Thule Jace is what we're, we're choosing to call him. I will say that this one, like, gave me whiplash because it's so different, the perspectives. On one hand, you have Jem, who's living his life with his, you know, he's loving his family, he's loving his baby. And then you've got Thule Jace, who's an absolute psycho. <laughs> you know, it's it's so sudden. You know, Jem's perspective will be him loving his baby, loving Kate, you know, just loving children. And then suddenly Thule Jace is killing children. And it's so sudden. I will say I don't particularly understand why Thule Jace is relevant. I don't really know why he's there. He was just suddenly in Queen of Air and Darkness and I thought he was going to be like just something to do with Ash maybe. And then he showed up in the epilogue, which I have so many thoughts about the epilogue not being about any of the main characters. I actually read the epilogue of Queen of Air and Darkness then went back and reread the end and pretended I hadn't read the actual epilogue because it seemed so pointless. I was like, what? what is the point in any of this? Who are you? Why are you here? Nobody asked for a second Jace Herondale, yet we have a second Jace Herondale. Why? <laughs> I'm hoping he's going to have something to do because he does seem like he could be an interesting character because he has all of these woes and internal conflicts taking place. So I would like to see something come of that, but... I don't know if it will, like, I hope he's not the main villain, that's my main thing, I've seen a few people speculating that he might be the villain of the Wicked Powers, I hope not, So I just don't want that, not, not the greatest villain I was expecting for the last series of the Shadowhunter Chronicles, and I'm kind of hoping he gets dealt with quickly and swiftly, and hopefully not even in a dramatic way, like, 
I want him just to walk into a room all like, ah, Clary, I've come to kill you. And then somebody just stabs him and he dies and they're all just like, hmm, and continue drinking tea or something. Like, I don't want him to be a big deal because I don't particularly understand why he's there. So unless he's suddenly going to have some massive thing that isn't just, hey, I'm Asher's tutor and I'm obsessed with Clary, then you know, why, why is he there, really? I will say that I thought he was kind of funny in a way. Like, he was such a psycho. I'm waiting to see people online, like sympathizing for him and being like oh but you know yeah he tried to kill max but he's sad because i know i know i'm gonna see it he looks like jason erdil of course i'm gonna see that and i did think it was kind of funny that max is this tiny child hanging off his leg like yay uncle jace i love you and holly's thinking is like wow gotta kill that like it was i don't i don't like him as a character but i did think it was quite funny also incredibly stressful there was a moment where i was like oh my god he might actually kill max and then i was like no no he won't he won't she wouldn't do that she wouldn't kill off you know little max like would be but i'm concerned now i've said that <laughs> no so it was quite funny seeing him just just the fact that his first response to everything was die like literally every situation he was in that he didn't want to be in he was like well i guess i gotta kill and you know it's definitely not a way you should deal with things but it was certainly a funny way to see him deal with things especially when Every time the perspective changed from him, you had Jem Carstairs, who was literally the complete opposite. I did love every bit of Jem's perspective in this book. I thought it was all absolutely amazing, especially in Forever Fallen, with all of just the little family bits. Like, he didn't have a plot line, and I was okay with that, because it was just so cute. Like, I knew I was going to cry at every Carstairs family moment. I, I knew it was going to happen, but it was just so much softer than I was like even expecting. When he had Mina, little little baby Mina, in the baby carrier, and he just took her on a journey, and they were going on an adventure to get some pastries, and it was just so cute. And when he called her a little silly melon, I was like, <laughs> it's so soft. And all of that was so cute. And also Kit. I really enjoyed seeing Kit's interactions with them, and how Tessa and Jem really want him to be a part of the family. I was a bit iffy in Queen of Our Darkness about how that storyline would go and how Kit would fit in with their dynamic, but he does fit in so well, even if he doesn't particularly know it himself. And that was just so soft to see. And all of like the sort of fatherly moments between him and Jem were really cute. And when he was talking to Mina, when, when Jem's just at the door and he's just like having a pep talk with Mina, he's just like, look, come on, <laughs> don't cry, don't do that. I was like, it, it was such a Kit move. I love how Kit's character is always consistent in little things like that. And just seeing their family life was so adorable. And honestly, she could release an entire series of stories just about their family life, like no plot line, just that. And I would be so happy. And we haven't even discussed the name of the baby yet. What? Wilhelmina? Wil Wil Wilhelmina? Wil I'm just going to say Wilhelmina, it's easier. But I think we all knew. I saw lots of people saying, oh, it'll be Charlotte or it'll be Rosemary and all of these things. But I think deep down we all knew it was just going to be a female version of Will's name. Like, <laughs> even Jim, I think, says it at some point, like, basically just off the bat, like, obviously, this is what we were going to call the kid. And she's so cute. And little baby Mina and Kit calling her Min Min. I was like, <laughs> so soft and after all of these months of waiting for baby casters to have a name now being able to tag her as mina casters just makes my day so that is my rundown of all of the ghosts of the shadow markets short stories and mainly just my opinion i'm sorry if you were looking for like a really factual discussion because that's not what this was it was just me ranting about gem casters i only have a few kind of broader points to make so i will start with the cons just to get them out of the way and all I really had to say about it is just the usual whenever a book is co-written, and that is that I could kind of see the difference in the writing styles. But I think you always see that. It'll never be perfect. And it wasn't negative. You know, I didn't read it and be like, oh, well, this isn't Cassandra Clare. It did take me out of the story sometimes a bit because I was aware that it had changed. And suddenly I was like, oh, my God, yeah, this was written by someone. It's not real, which obviously it's not really the book, but like, you know. But I think that was my main point in it. I also found that it felt a bit rushed as far as the writing was concerned. But this isn't the first time I've had this with a Cassandra Clare book. I felt the same about Red Scrolls of Magic. Just that it felt a little rushed and a little simplified at the same time. There was parts where I was reading it and I was like, I feel this could have been done better. And I'm not a professional in any way, but it just felt a little simple. I don't know if that's because 
I've just finished reading books by other authors. I've been reading a lot of Sarah J Maas recently, whose books are kind of aimed at a more mature audience than Cassandra Clare's books are. So whether that's just kind of the, the difference and it's the change of target audience, but this in Red Scrolls of Magic did just feel a little rushed as far as the writing was concerned. I also found the whole first air thing a bit confusing, which I've mentioned several times, but that might just be because I'm stupid. I don't know. <laughs> there was a lot of information to take in. I think that's mainly what it was. There was so much information. However, you don't have to have read these to understand that. In Queen of Air and Darkness, it was all explained in a much simpler fashion, so you didn't need all of the extra stuff. But having the extra stuff, oh, it just like battered my brain for so long. That's the only overall cons I think I have. But in general, I really enjoyed reading this. Again, like I said at the beginning, I could be a bit biased because I love Gem Caster so much. But in general, I loved it. I thought it was funny. I really enjoyed seeing a different side to Gem's character and also different characters and being introduced more to the Last Hours characters. I thought the plot line that ran throughout it in the way it kind of stayed consistent as the stories continued worked well. And just seeing all the little insights into his life and into Tessa's life was just so cute. It was, yeah, it was, it was good. I definitely recommend reading this if you're a big fan of the Shadowhunter Chronicles. As with all of the spin-offs like this, I'd say if you're not massively into them and you haven't read all of the other books and you don't like massively care about it, maybe don't read it. As with the other short stories, you don't have to read them. You can read the other ones fine. I, I would still say if you plan on reading them all and you're interested in them all, definitely read it because it adds more to the story and it does cover up a few gaps. Uh, the same way that Tales from the Shadow and Academy did and even the Bane Chronicles in ways, but you definitely don't have to read it. Only if you're really interested in the characters, I suppose, and especially Jem and Tessa and Will, because even though Will's not in it, he's mentioned all the time, obviously. But... Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it as someone who's a massive fan of the entire series. I thought it was great seeing all these characters that I loved and also cameos from other characters. You know, Lily was in it a lot. Magnus and Alec were in it a lot. You know, all the faves. And I am really excited to see how the Wicked Powers goes because, you know, that's what we were setting up for here. The last line was to summon Wicked Powers. We're setting up for that and I think that's going to be big. So in however many years it takes to get to that, I do think that ghosts will end up of being... A very good sort of passage into the Wicked Powers and Kit and Ty's characters, especially as they were shown at the end of this with them maturing a little more. So I'm very excited to see what comes next and I'm very glad that I got this. <laughs> That's all from me for now. Please do comment your opinions on Ghosts of the Shadow Market if you've read it and you know where the subscribe button is. I will see you again with a new video next Wednesday but until then, bye!